let's get started. So this this guest lecture will be introducing my work uh, from my, from the doctoral period to my current project uh, at Sergi, and I'm very excited to, to have this opportunity to be the first of my cohorts to to use to use this um, this chance of a guest uh, lecture. And so, as we were told, we we need to intro to include this little sentence about the uh, fact that our project received funding from the EU uh, for every sort of public communication. So here it is. And just for a brief introduction, and sorry for the font which I should have changed, uh, I'm just going to start by introducing very briefly what I've been doing. So I started my PhD in Warwick in 2017, and I finished it in 2021. It was called Charting the Populist Style, Trump, Le Pen, and the Populist Repertoire of Exclusionary Nationalism, which was a project conducted interdisciplinarily in between the, the Department of Politics and the Department of Theatre and Performance Studies. And in a nutshell, it was a comparative case study of uh, presidential campaigns of Donald Trump and Marine Le Pen. Since 2022, I've been, uh, uh, I joined CY Paris as a Marie Curie Utopia SIF uh, postdoctoral fellow, and I'm currently hosted by LT2D, Laboratoire Lexic Text Discours Dictionnaire, for a project called Performance of a Climate Crisis, which, which is still in its early premises. I've started in September, and it's only been two months in. So the end of this talk is going to be about this new project. But in the meantime, let me go back to this notion of style. And so my, my work is part of what, uh, what is now called the stylistic approach to populism. And I'm just going to start with this. I don't know if it works yet. So this thing is called a stylus, uh, which, which I've given us the French for stylo, which is a, a tool used uh, uh, in the antiquity to write on wax tablet. And through a metonymic slide from instrument to result, style or stylus became uh, moved from just the instrument to way of writing and then to the way of expressing oneself. It's been then associated with rhetoric. I'm so sorry, the, 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 like the, the font is incredibly strange. It didn't look like this when I, when I worked on it. So, so sorry, please bear with me in spite of a very, of a very strange sort of, uh, sort of font. So let me go back to this. So with notion of style, initially was associated with rhetoric, whatever, whether it is the Lexis, when it was used by the Greek, or, or Elocutio or Cicero, which is in, in a nutshell the form taken by language. But of course, in its inception, style has, already, has always had a sort of negative connotation, in the sense that it is something that is immoral. That you just have to look at how Plato depicts Socrates talking to sophists and the people using style as, someone, as people that are just misleading the, the people or at best something that is superficial, secondary, or even just cosmetic. So in political science, style likewise has also been relegated to the outside uh, of mainstream political science as some, a surface level feature of politics. So something for media scholars, cultural theorists, and rhetoricians to study. So not serious stuff. Uh, if you're a serious political scientist, you're going to look at the speech, like the ideology. And yet what's interesting that in spite of this sort of uh, secondary status, but the notion of style never never quite disappeared. It's typically ill-defined as a, an elusive je ne sais quoi, something that people struggle to, to, to pinpoint. But what is interesting is that in spite of all this, it keeps a sort of intuitive power and empirical relevance. And again, please bear with me with very strange fonts. I think this is the formatting from Mac to, to, uh, to Windows. But this notion for me of style in politics uh, brings us back to a very old debate on the distinction, which is uh, arguably challengeable, but very stimulating conceptually of the content and form. Whether we talk about substance and ideas when we talk about content or medium articulation. And my work is roughly placed in this notion. I'm interested in what is said and also how it's being said, so content and form. So now let's go back and let's take one step back and, and, and talk about this notion of populism. Uh, uh, in this very uh, amphitheater, uh, David Copello a couple of years ago discussed the notion of populism in a, in a very far way. So I'm not, I'm going to try and do something very complementary to what he said. But just to start with populism, this image is an image uh, made by, by an AI when you inputted populism, which I think is quite interesting because it shows a group of people, I think a group of individuals, you can see silhouettes. We see the red color, which can be the red of socialism, maybe red of violence. We see a sort of raised fist, uh, there's this notion of city. So I think this kind of captures a lot of, uh, a lot of intuitive things that arrive when we, talk, when we think of populism. And 
uh, David started his talk by saying that populism was an essentially contested concept, which means a concept uh, that is so uh, that is so complex and so deep at its core that it's impossible to to find an agreement. And it's true that there are countless definitions of populism which compete and coexist. And that's this idea that uh, uh, typically in the literature you're going to start every article, every book we start with. Here is what populism is, and but we can't quite define what it is. But what's more interesting is that since 2017, there's been an emergence of a sort of minimal consensus uh, around two core ideas. So populism, and most definitions agree on this. So populism is an opposition between the people and the elite. So in, in, a, in other words, people centrism and anti-elitism. But even though there's a sort of rising consensus on this, two notions there's still no consensus of what is populism what nature is this and there's like people talk about it as an ideology a frame a movement a discourse a logic a strategic and this is uh and this has led the literature to be quite uh but i've been as if the case for most social sciences uh to be quite divided around three i would say dominant paradigms so first one is the so-called ideational approach which uh, is the most uh, popular, most mainstream, and most well cited, even in the media. I think the Guardian and the, and the New York Times use the additional approach as their stand at their baseline. I'm going to talk a bit more about it, but in a nutshell, the idea that populism is content, it is an ideology, but it is thin, which means it, is, it, it doesn't answer every sort of a question that a, an ideology could answer. It's based on the approach to ideologies called the morphological approach by Michael Frieden. So the idea is that you have thin and thick ideology. And so because populism is thin, because it has this people elite thing, but not more than that, it needs to be attached to a host ideology, uh, socialism, for instance, and then uh, it gets filled. So it's a very uh, intuitive and intuitively compelling idea, but I'm going to discuss why it is problematic. And for me, the two main reasons is that, it's, uh, especially the first one, it starts with the idea that populism is inherently anti-pluralist, but it's, the, it's about creating the people and nothing else can, can stand against it. But the main names are, are obviously Dutch uh, political scientist Cass Müller, which you, you, if you've ever read, read anything about populism, you've certainly seen that name, but also Cristobal Rovira Calvasser, or even Jan Werner Müller for a variation of, on this approach. The second approach I'm not going to spend too much time on, uh, even later in the presentation, but it's an approach that is called a strategic approach, which was born in Latin America. And the idea was populism is it's not about the ID, so it's about the link, the direct and mediated link between leader and followers. So populism is about uh, personalistic leadership. I think it would be what we would describe as Bonapartism, Caesarism, the sort of direct connection between a strong man and, especially a man, and, uh, and, 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 and his followers. The key pro proponents of the approach are Kurt Wieland. And then there's the approach that, in, uh, that I'm obviously a bit biased because I'm a part of, which is called the discursive performative approach. It's a broad name, and I'm going to unpack what it means. But in a nutshell, we we kind of we we start by uh, challenging these sort of normative biases around populism, which I'm going to be to be discussing in a minute. The key influence here is uh, Argentinian philosopher Ernesto Laclau, and the idea that populism is based on empty signifiers. So just hold on with me, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk about what empty signifiers mean. So, and just for to answer this question, let's think about this. Simple question, who is the people? When you say, I defend the people, who is the people? And I think this notion of the people and the, uh, is so, let's say, multifaceted that it can be, it can mean the popular class, you can talk about the poor people, it can be the nation. When, when Trump says the American people, he doesn't mean the poor, he means the, the nation. He can be inclusive in a way that the people can be open to anybody who identifies as such. Or it can be exclusive. For instance, you could draw a cultural line, ethnic ethnical line. You can think of a white people in a, in subtext, socially, racially. You can talk about the people of one country on a national level. You can talk about the people of a smaller place, like the people of your of your hometown, or even the global people, which is which to, which we're going to go back to this notion when we talk about the ecology. But let's say that. Laclo, when he talks about empty signifiers, he means that when you mention the people fighting against the elite. All you mention are empty words and that need to, to be filled by some sort of content. And so both the people and the elite are empty in itself. They don't mean much outside of, um, outside of whatever the, the person using them are going, is going to attribute to it. So what it means here is that, okay, if you, if you identify something as opposing the people and the elite, it should be the start of the analysis and not its end. 
And so it needs a sort of content to become political in the sort of uh, grander way. But what is interesting is that while populism itself uh, relies on empty signifier, it is not an empty concept. Populism has both positive and negative connotations. And I think it is necessary as scholars to understand that when you talk about populism in the public sphere, people already have ideas about what populism is. In the plus side, on sort of positive aspects, populism is still linked with this notion of democracy, of popular power and popular sovereignty. The idea that, for instance, democracy is the demos kratos, the power of the, of the crowd, of the people. But on the, on the flip side, and that's perhaps the most used uh, way of, of talking about populism, it is associated with demagoguery, with amateurism, with illiberalism, and more generally with the far right. When you say fear of the, the populist or be afraid of, uh, of, of a, such a populist stance, so this usually means the far right. And, what is it? And, and that's, that's what I mean when I say a critical approach, that we need to be aware of these meanings to engage with them and to sort of develop them in, a, in, a, in our own way. And so I'm going to talk about two normative challenges that, uh, that emerge through this notion of, um, of, uh, of populism as read uh, uh, by, by the wider audience. The first one is, uh, starts from a very basic premise, the idea that Nobody self-defines as populist. You have people that define themselves as socialists, as liberals, or as feminists. But populism in itself is not, uh, it doesn't have self-descriptive value. So nobody says they are populist, outside in uh, rare cases, but uh, usually as a way to kind of challenge the status quo. But instead, populism is used by mainstream politicians and more typically liberal center, uh, analysts, journalists, to sort of discredit the opponents. And I think that's the, the sort of meaning we've been using. And this has led to a new field of research called anti-populism within populism studies that looks at how populism is being used as a tool. So it doesn't look at who are the populist, it looks at who is using the word populist to discredit others. And I think it, for instance, the notion of populism leads to horseshoe theory. This is, uh, this is a, a small cartoon by Plantu who's, who developed this idea and the host, of, of the horseshoe host, the theory. He calls it l'ascension des néopopulistes, the, the rise of a neopopulist. And, and what you can see here is Jean-Luc Mélenchon and Marine Le Pen, both with a, a speech with written tous pourri, all corrupted, which makes this sort of horseshoe shape. And the idea of the horseshoe theory is that the extremes are bad, is that the extreme right and the extreme left are basically saying the same thing. And that in the long, in the long term, they kind of join in the middle. And, and I think this is an incredibly problematic sort of stance because it puts an equal sign and an equal level of danger between the extreme right visually fascists and rather radical left. And it undermined any sort of radical alternatives to the status quo by framing them as undemocratic. So if you say these people are populist, don't listen to them, you are, you are framing them as, uh, as dangerous, which leads us to a famous TINA, so there is no alternative to, to, centri to, to moderate centrism. And I think uh, as scholars, it is important to consider that populism is weaponized and used. So when we use the concept ourselves, we should be cautious of who we call populist, how we call them, and why we call them populist, and what it, what it means, and how it resonates with these sort of meanings. Okay, this is the first normative challenge, the anti-populism. The second one has been called the populist hype. And I think this, is, uh, this graph comes from uh, the handbook on populism in 2017, and it charts every book published with the name populist, of the populist populism in the title. And this is 2000s, and I'm, I can pretty, I'm pretty sure that it keeps on rising exponentially. The populism as a concept has become dominant so much that it has, out, it has uh, outclassed uh, poor right, radical right, and other sort of um, com competing concepts. And since the 2000s, but even more since the twin shock of 2016, so the election of Trump and Brexit, the use of the term exploded, but not only in academia, but also in the wider media and public discourse. And I think, and some scholars have highlighted that this is called a hype. So they, in a very, in a sort of landmark article that kind of was a slap to my face when I first heard about it and to the field was saying that what you're doing is that you're hyping a concept that does not exist outside of this specific context. The idea is that uh, the argument that, that Monton, Aurélien Monton and Jason Cleaners do is that they say populism is used before and instead of the, the actual descriptive concepts. So you don't say the far right anymore, the nativists or the radical right, you say the populists, which is problematic because it conceals the characteristics, the features of populism. Because when you say they are populist, you can, you, it, it sort of, it euphemizes the sort of far right content that they might be hiding. And it grants the far right actors a popular sort of legitimacy in the sense that it associates them with the idea that they speak in the name of the people. So 
the, the point that, that Montan and Klinos do uh, uh, say is that we should stop using populism when it's not actually populism. And when it's before right, we should just be talking about for right. And, can, and you, can, you must imagine that for the whole field that talks about populism, it keep on talking about it. It was really uh, uh, a huge sort of uh, challenge. But as a whole, this notion of the hype means that you need to be very cautious about how you distinguish populism from far right, from radical left, and from every sort of uh, uh, contiguous concept. Because it is intellectually unsatisfying to call populism something that is not. And believe me, we, we, for instance, with the, with the rise of, uh, of Meloni uh, uh, in, in, in Italy, this notion of uh, is Meloni a fascist, a post fascist, uh, is, uh, uh, is La Lega and Matteo Salvini a uh, right, radical right, populist, is Berlusconi himself a populist? I think it is very important to, to, to be aware that these categories cannot be applied to all the far right and at the same time that it applies beyond the far right. And I think that's precisely where I'm going for. So let's talk about. Let's go back to the main approach. And again, I'm really startled by this strange font. I'm so sorry. I hope you, it's not too, too, too difficult. Uh, the, the, the thin ideology approach, or called ideational approach, is dominant. And so dominant that it's hegemonic. It's the one that, by default, if you just want to use the word populism and you don't want to talk about it too much, you just say, I use the ideational approach and it works. And just to be completely fair to the definition, uh, here is how Mu defines populism. It says it is a thin centered ideology that considers society to be separated into two homogeneous and antagonistic camps, the pure people versus the corrupt elite. And which argues that politics should be an expression of the volonté générale of the people, the vox populi, or vox populi. And I think this definition in itself already falls into the two traps of anti-populism and populist type. First, it uses morally loaded, con con for instance, it talks about the pure people and the corrupt elite that is homogeneous. And uh, there's been very uh, outstanding work, I'm thinking of the George that showed that showed that the people doesn't have to be homogeneous and that the elite is typically more heterogeneous, that the elite is not necessarily corrupt, it, it can just be misintentioned. And the people doesn't have to be pure, pure sort of implies a sort of far right, pure white people, for instance. So this definition itself already contains very morally loaded terms that they frame and without challenging them. And of course, the difficult thing with this in and host ideology, but it's hard to say what is populist and what is far right again. So it's hard to, distant, to disentangle what is the host ideology and from what is populism. So us on the critical side, we've, we've seen that and we've seen, especially we, we've heeded the, the plea of anti-populism and the populist hype uh, scholarship. And so what has happened is that people have started uh, developing a sort of a set of rules on how to be critical when you talk about populism. This article from 2018, uh, called the nine rules of critical engagement has been a sort of moment where we start to 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 convert and to 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 make an, an alternative to this homogeneous status to this uh, uh, hegemonic status of the other approach. And so, what used to be very different approaches, and believe me, we even in the critical approach we have at least twenty five definitions of what populism is, have started to converge. We've converged firstly around the work of Laclau, and most particularly on a post structural framework. So, for those of you not in social sciences. I'm not going to go in depth about what post-structuralism is, but again, go back to this idea of empty signifier. Uh, um, words have meaning and we need to, to interrogate what they mean politically. So in a very, very uh, so rough, united way, populism is seen here as the logic of articulation of the antagonism between people and elites. And I'm going to go back to, to this. But let's say that all of these convergence has led us to, to, to use the name that, that has now been coined last year of the discursive performative approach. And I'm gonna talk about this. Um, again, the discursive performative approach is very complicated. There's people that follow Laclau quite directly. They just modernize him. Uh, they follow what is called the SX school of discourse analysis. Then there's people that are kind of against Laclau, typically more scientific, more positivist, more empirically driven. And they try to do something that is less theoretical. Uh, you, may, you may have heard of uh, Ruth Wodak, a big name. Uh, she wrote a book called The Politics of Fear uh, on, the, uh, on, on the right wing populism. And then there's the school of which I'm a part of, the Social Cultural Performative School. And finally, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to lead to what I'm saying. So, to, to the point that I'm defending. But the idea is that we follow Laclau, but we adapt him differently. We also bring in new disciplines, so sociology, performance studies, as I do. And we try to go beyond discourse, not just looking at words, but also looking at culture, the wider context, and also embodied performances. The big names here are Pierre Rostigui from uh, uh, Chile, Ben Moffet from Australia, and Maria Esperanza Casulo from Argentina. And let's go back to the thing I showed you at the very start, this distinction between content and form. 
And my argument here is that this will quite well talk about populism. That populism, that populism is a form. I call it a style, but we could, we could talk about an aesthetic and a logic and articulation. Well, on the other side, it, has the, uh, uh, it gives shape and is being shaped in retrospect by content, by a sort of ideological, whether it is far right, radical left. So let me just walk you through what I mean by style and how style has been used in the discipline. And first, I want to show that I did not invent anything. Uh, this is a concept word of style that has been used since 1984, even by Canovan, but 1995, 1999. And this kind of statement that I'm making, I'm not the first one to do it, of course. Uh, uh, Margaret Canovan, probably one of the most uh, important scholars in populism studies, talked about populism as a matter of style rather than substance. Alan Knight talked about populism and said that it does not relate to an ideology. And Tagev, who unfortunately changed his mind quite a lot after that, said that there was no particular ideological, ideolog ideological content to populism, but it is a style applicable to various ideological frameworks. But the issue with these first approaches and first uses of populism is that they were inconsistent and vague. Typically, uh, they didn't define what style is. They just used style as this je ne sais quoi. With, uh, I don't know what it is, but it is, it is a style. And they never sort of developed a, a full flesh definition. And the other big issue that I have with them is that they usually talk about rhetoric style or discursive style, and they, which kind of brings us back to text when I think we should go beyond this notion of text. And here comes... Uh, in 2016, the scholar that kind of redefined style by, create, by providing a sort of uh, systematic definition. Before him, as I was telling you, the, the literature was very, very scattered all over the place. So what he did is that he defined what is a political style. He used the work from people from rhetoric, from political representation and political communication. And he said, style or uh, any style, so he used style in a plural form, styles are the repertoires of embodied, symbolically mediated performances made to audiences that are used to create and navigate the field of power. So that's very long, but just in a nutshell, the repertoires of embodied performances. I think that's uh, any style or is a repertoire. And I'm going to go back to this notion. And after he defined what is style, he developed a, a first big cohesive apl application of what populism is as a style. And in his book by 2016 called The Global Rights of Populism, he, he argued that populism had three core features. One being an appeal to the people versus the elite. The second one being bad manners. And I'm going to go back to it later. And then performance of crisis, breakdown of threat. However, even after Moffitt started, but uh, even uh, it, it all started before, there, were, there have been quite a few challenges to the stylistic approach by the other ones. So the first one, for instance, is saying that it's Fieschi. Catherine Pesky, who says that it's not doing populism justice to imply that something frivolous or at the very least inessential or superficial. Uh, Kurt Whelan from a strategic approach said political style is a broad and not clearly delimited kind of concept. But even in our approach for critical people, they say populism is not just a popular style of talking, acting, or looking like ordinary people. And like Juan Stavrakakis in 2017 said, we prefer the term discourse or discursive logic because discourse should not be treated as secondary or superficial, which is an unavoidable connotation of style. And I think this all stems from a misunderstanding of what style is. But let me just, but first, I think populism has already, uh, even in the mainstream literature, has always been seen as secondary. It is secondary to the host ideology. Like if you look at Mood and the others, populism is always the secondary thing to the key content. And I think this sort of, but I think more generally, the, these issues, this, uh, criti this uh, critique stem from a sort of misunderstanding about what style really is ontologically. And typically because the people are based in political science, they don't really talk about this notion. There's a sort of prejudice that links style with superficiality. And as, as such, it creates a sort of hierarchical binary where substance or content is always more important and worth more attention than form. And even in the critical approach, when they say we should use discourse to talk about populism, it's not helpful because if you say populism is a discourse and far right is a discourse, how do you distinguish content and the way it's being articulated? And I think that's exactly why I'm saying in a big break from this tradition that we cannot talk about just discourse or discursive frame, we need to talk about style. But I know the word has this connotation of uh, superficiality and of course aesthetic, cosmetic, but I think it is, uh, it, it is conceptually productive to do that. So what I'm trying to do here, and again, I'm not the only one, it's trying to go beyond this sort of prejudice on the style and move past this blur. 
So now that I've sort of stated my case for why the stylistic approach, let me sort of show you that even Moffitt, the person who designed the systematic approach has its own limitations. The first one is that he uses concept of performance, like uh, actor, scene, audience. The whole book is structured around this. He talks about performance, performativity, repertoire. And believe me, when I saw his book, that was a kind of uh, mo like mic drop moment for me. I was like, okay, my, my thesis has been written by someone else. So uh, why, am, why am I even trying? But what I, did, what I found fascinating, the more I read into it, is that I realized he never defined these terms. He never says what is performance. He never says what is performativity. He never says what is a repertoire. And then my other issue, and I'm not going to go too much in the details, but he, he like the three features he showed do not have internal cohesion. One is an appeal, one is manners, and one is performance. And I think it's a bit hard to put them together. And there's no cohesion with what a repertoire is, because an appeal cannot be part of a repertoire, or is it? Or how do you define appeal? So I think the more I read into his book, the more I, I realized that I needed to go a bit deeper. And that and but we, we cannot just be satisfied with using words like actor, scene, audience without defining what they are, which is really the minimum when you're, in, when you're using concepts like this. So my key sort of uh, uh, critique to him is that he is limited because he's a political scientist, because he doesn't want to go beyond the limits of his own discipline. And that's when I, I introduced performance studies. Performance studies is, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take too long to discuss it, but it's initially a discipline that emerged in the eighties based on theater studies. The, uh, I mean, I could just quote in a very sort of, um, cliched way, everything that I did in my, in my presentation, that is all the world's a stage, say Shakespeare. It's, the, it's this idea that theater does not stop at the stage, at the limits of the stage. You need to look at performance beyond it and everything, if you look at the, Every sort of social activity is a performance once you sort of develop that idea. What I'm doing right now is a performance. What, what you're doing when you're talking with your, with your friend and, and family, even in a private setting, is a sort of performance because you're, manip you're, you're, you're manipulating a certain image of that you want to send to the others. Any sort of performance that involves individuals, everything uh, is performance. And let me just give you a definition of what performance is. It's any action conducted with the intention of being seen by someone else. But it, which is incredibly broad, but it means as long as there's two people that are interacting and know that they're interacting, you have a performance, which, which includes pretty more, much more than you could imagine. And I think it's a very productive lens to look at politics, but, uh, but also at many other sort of fields. And now let me just sort of apply this notion to, to populism. So when I, I was complaining that Moffat was not defining what a repertoire is, because his definition is very vague, uh, he uses, uh, like, Hariman, his inspiration only uses, uh, uh, only mentions it for one sentence in a book of 200 pages and does not quite say what a repertoire is. And the other big definition that Moffat doesn't use, but that in politics we use is Charles Tilly's Repertoires of Contention, which is a very interesting book, by the way. But, um, but my issue is that Tilly himself acknowledges that he uses the word because it's a nice metaphor, because repertoire is easy to kind of capture. And what I'm not understanding is that why don't we look at uh, uh, sort of landmark work in performance studies? So let me introduce you to Diane, Diane Taylor, or Diana Taylor, an American uh, scholar from, of performance studies that works on Latin America. And in one of the most important uh, articles of performance studies called The Archive and the Repertoire, she distinguishes the archive, that is material that remains, stuff that is here that you can find in the archive, and repertoire, that is the ephemeral, ephemeral repertoire of embodied practice and knowledge. So what she does is that the she says that we need to, we, we, can, we have to shift between what is enduring, that is text, that is uh, statues, buildings, and we can look at what is being done. And she emphasizes individual agency in the sense that uh, people can do something, embodiment, which means we need people to enact this repertoire and presence. And just to illustrate what she means, for in a, in a sort of, here is the very long quote that I'm going to, to read to you that talks about football and dance as repertoires. As opposed to the supposedly stable objects in the archive, the actions that are the repertoire do not remain the same. The repertoire both keeps and transforms choreographies of meaning. Sports enthusiasts might claim that soccer has remained unchanged for the past hundred years. Even the players and fans from different countries have appropriated the event in diverse ways. Dances change over time even though a generation of dancers and even individual dancers swear they're always the same. But even though the embodiment changes, the meaning might very well remain the same. And this notion of repertoire, I think it's fascinating 
an application of so many things, but for populism, I think it, it works perfectly. So what I did is I sort of converted the definition of Moffitt and here's my own work. So I said style is an open-ended in the sense that it can, can be changed. There's no closed the notion of it. A repertoire of embodied performances. I, instead of talking about the features, which I think, again, are kind of descriptive and inconsistent, I talk about clusters, performative clusters. And by cluster, I mean just a group of performances that join together in one purpose. Um, again, clusters are ideal types in the sense that um, they are not meant to be uh, isolated, pure thing you can find. In, in practice, the, the clusters are constantly interwoven and interacting. But I think it's an interesting notion because it can it, it shows the sort of rhizomatic nature of these performances. They, they, they all that all share a sort of similar purpose. And again, each of the classes I'm going to talk about is a necessary but not sufficient component of a populist style. So if you have only one of them, that doesn't make you a populist. You need a combination of all three. And what it does by framing populism as a repertoire is that I stopped talking about he is a populist or he or she is not. I think in my first year, everybody was asking me, so is Marine Le Pen a populist? Or is Jeremy Corbyn, is Bernie Sanders a populist? And my question was always, the answer was always difficult. Like, and if you look at populism as a repertoire, you stop looking in black and white terms. It's a, a, all shades of gray. You can be more or less populist. And I wouldn't even say you are a populist. I think you're using populist tropes, you're using this repertoire. But I prefer to talk about actors mobilizing populism rather than populist actors. So as a, as a result, it means that this is a binary, that you have a political actors can, which can adopt to populist style at different moments. In some campaigns, people use more, use it more, and in some other moments, they don't. And I think it is really important to, to, to see it like this as a, a set of practice, as a gradational stuff, not just as he's a populist, tick box, and he's not. I think that leaves you a much more nuanced uh, kind of grasp on reality. And so what I did is that I turned the three features of Moffitt into performative clusters. And I call them performances of identity, performances of transgression, and performances of crisis. And now after I spent, I don't know, 30 minutes talking, talking about populism and like meta discussion on literature, let me just talk to you about what populism is actually is according to that sort of definition. First one is identity. Um, this is probably the core of populism. This is based on Laclau and Chantal Mouffe. And but this is, this is the, the cluster that connects me to the discursive approach. It's about saying that pop, populism is framing politics as the opposition between people and elites. But again, when you say, as I very said, when I started, people and elites are empty signifiers. They need to be defined. So the, the, your ideology will define your, the, how you frame the people. If you're on far right, it's going to be an ethnically, racially closed people. When, when, you're in, when you're in the radical left, it's going to be a sort of uh, culturally... Uh, vaguely defined sort of inclusive people. But what I, but what I bring on addition, addition to, to this course is the notion of performativity. For, for those of you, again, not in social sciences, performativity is kind of one of the key concepts that performance studies brings to, to, to the field. Uh, Judith Butler, very famous uh, political theorist, but also social theorist and feminist uh, scholar, talks about performativity through gender. She says gender is not something that exists. It's something that is being performed on a regular basis. Uh, uh, it, it's a set of performances that if we if we would all stop doing them, would cease to exist. But because we are compelled by the sort of deep uh, systemic root of our society, we perform a certain vision of masculinity and femininity, which we can negotiate at the margin, but we are still faced with a sort of fight. And so the idea of performativity is something comes to existence through performance. And that is exactly what happens with the people and the elite. I'm going to quote more of it here. Populist actors do not speak to or speak for some pre-existing people out there that exists, but already bring the, the subject known as the people into being through naming performance or articulation. What that means is that the people does not mean anything. The people is performatively created through performance, and that's the same for the elite. So both of them are the products of a sort of performativity. But the other flip side of it is that while you have the people and the elite as sort of collective products of performativity, then, and that's the specificity of my approach, we need embodiment, that is, uh, political actors that act as populist leaders, which make a claim to represent the people. And I think I use the work of Michael Sayward, who talks about representation, not as something you gain after an election, but as something you constantly perform. I'm a representative of X state or, or, or X city or, or country. And while people and elite, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go into an, another horrible word here, while people and elite are empty, 
the, the, the leader is overflowing in the sense that the leader has as many identities as there are people looking at them. So because the purpose leader becomes a point of articulation, think of someone like Trump or think of even someone like Mélenchon, they're not a blank slate. When you look at them, they are a combination of a million of, uh, of uh, a myriad of perspectives on what they are. So their, their identity is linked to the multiple interpretations of the leader invested within that person on the part of the people. That is, there are as many readings as there are followers. And to go a bit deeper than that, you, to be a populist leader is synecdocal. Uh, you, you probably know what a synecdoche is or metonymy. Uh, it's the idea of talking about a part of something to refer to the whole. For instance, I'm drinking a glass instead of drinking water. Um, the idea that uh, Maria Esperanza Castro uh, developed is the idea that when you're a populist, you need to perform uh, yourself as in between part of the people, like the people, but also different from it. That is being ordinary, like I'm a bit like you, I talk like you, I move like you, and, but also extraordinary, like I'm the one presenting you. And, and it's a very subtle tightrope exercise of being between them. And what is very important in this approach is that populism is relational. It, you, you need the sort of back and forth between the audience and the performer. And I hope it, I, I hope I didn't lose you. I didn't lose you with, with, with too many details. But here it's just a, a sort of a summary summarized graph that I did for my thesis. So on on the one hand, you have collective constructs like the elite and the people, and then the leader that acts as the individual place of of embodiment. And you have the elite that stands up opposed to the people, and the leader both performs extraordinariness to be like the elite, but also ordinariness to be like the people. And I think it's um, I think it's it's kind of helpful to see it like this. Okay, so this was part number one. Part number two is performing transgression. So what I mean by transgression is breaking a rule, the violation of a norm of political significance. So there's two sort of aspects to it. Strategically, it's about looking different from the others. It's about you know, not, not, not dressing like a politician, not talking like other politicians and breaking the idea of what a politician is to look different from the elite. And again, we go back to ordinariness. It's about looking like, but at the same time, and I think, and I'm not going to develop that because I'm writing an article on this at the moment. It's about ontologically uh, changing what Rancière called the distribution of the sensible. So you make people, you make perspectives that are invisibilized, subaltern, emerge like uh, creating the people means making making either the racist underbelly of society visible or also it can be about making the the oppressed uh, emerge and at the same time when you define the elite you may, you, you set into you, you give a clear face to underlying power structures you say we fight against the one percent and again finding about the one percent the wealthy the, the very rich is used as a metonymy to talk about the, the, the deep financial winners of capitalism. And again, defining who is the people and who is the elite is again back to content, to ideology. And I think that's what I want to stress, that every time there's a mode of doing it, but then for, if you're on details about the exact content, you need to look back at, uh, at content. And so there's many ways to, to look different from the others. And to be transgressive, the sort of classic perspective in the discipline they use is the idea of uh, flaunting the law. Uh, think of Michelle Obama when she says, when they go low, we go high. It's the idea of going low, of uh, embracing the social cultural law. So doing stuff like an ordinary person would. The Moffat talks about bad manners. And I think it's a very important part of how you can be transgressive, but it's not enough to just eat a sandwich uh, to, to appear uh, popular. You just, you just gotta ask Ed Miliband, for instance. But what I want to show and the concept I developed as transgression is I think it's something that is much more multifaceted and much more complex. Transgression can take many forms. And I wrote a whole article on it. And in it, I developed a sort of categorization of transgressive performances, depending on which norm they break. You have uh, norms that are interactional. That is, the interactional norm is when you interact with someone, there are a certain set of expectations, respect, being kind to the other, and you can, and by, for example, insult, insulting someone is a break of interactional norm. Rhetoric norm are about how you look like. So again, that, that's, going, that's going back to, to, to dressing in a certain way, to uh, so how you present yourself independently of others. And the last one is breaking theatrical norms. And here it's about the, the, the norms of a symbol, the symbolic rules of a political game. So the idea here is, um, we all know that politics is very theatrical. Uh, uh, 
politicians have a team of communicate uh, of, of people that that teach them about communication. They are trained to to be performers. They they, they, are, they have a stylist. Uh, uh, politics is incredibly theatrical, uh, uh, theatrical, and yet it's kind of unsaid because for a successful performance to be successful, you need to not know that it's theater. You need to you need to not see that it's staged. And I think a way to break that, and I think that's something Trump does a lot. For instance, Trump does this. Trump is incredibly insulting and rude. Trump does this in a way that he dresses differently, he speaks differently. But Trump does that a lot, and I think that's what surprised me in my thesis, is that he, break, he, he breaks the fourth wall often. That is, in, during debates with Clinton, he's, he's always, he's, Clinton will say something, and then he will stop. He will say, oh, this was a great pivot, or oh, it's just soundbite, people. So he's going to look at the, the, the audience, break the fourth wall, and talk to them and say, like, look, this is a performance. And, the, and, and, and by doing this, and by, by this, what, what I call metapolitical comments, he's going to, to, to put the audience on his side. They're saying, look, she is fake, but I'm not. When he is just as fake as she is, he's also bound by the same rules of political, side, political life. But by showing the ropes to the audience, I think that's being transgressive. Sorry, but it's a bit complex. But if you want to read more, I have a whole article that was published in March, and I think that's the... That's the one I'm most proud of uh, at this stage. Okay, so we talked about identity, people and elites. We talked about transgression, so appearing different. The last one is crisis. And I think that's gonna lead me to my, my project in, in, in Sergi. Here, I make a distinction which I follow, uh, in which I follow um, Colin Hay between failure and crisis. So there's this idea that crisis in the definition that goes like this, the crisis is both a moment of contradiction and a moment of intervention. The moment of the contradiction is a sort of objective thing. That's, that means it's a failure. It's in any, any issue. And there's many issues in society. Okay, we can think of racism, inequality, um, but you can think of any, any sort of systematic problem can be either failure. So this is to follow Lacan, the real. But the real does not come to the public domain without being mediated. So you need someone to intervene. You need someone to performatively turn it into a crisis. So for instance, if there's an issue with something, as long as someone doesn't bring it to a public debate and say, this is an issue, this does not become a crisis. Moffitt says that crisis, performing crisis is spectacularize, spectacularization of failure. It's about turning something that is wrong and making a show out of it or, uh, or showing it to the wider audience. And this, and of course, in the public domain, there's, um, there's as many crises as there are, uh, uh, many failures as you can imagine. Of course, the environmental crisis, which is my new project, crisis of identity, we can think of like the French identity is in trouble or American identity of masculinity, for instance. Ah, oh, crisis of masculinity, inequality representation. But I'm saying that not everything is real, but you, uh, not everything is construct, but you need a, a sort of basis and then you turn it into a crisis performatively. And so which one, of course, which one you choose depends on what your ideology. If you're on the left or if you're green, you're gonna focus about economic inequality, you're gonna focus about the environment and put these crises. If you're on the far right, you're going to talk about identity, you're going to talk about immigration, and you're going to frame these as crises. And so the question is about which narrative wins, which crisis is more resonant with the public these days. And this leads me, okay, now that I'm sorry, this is incredibly long and theoretical. I hope you, uh, you found it interesting in, in a way. Let me just try and see, show you how it applies to, to, to my concept of, of a far right. So my, my project on the far right was a comparison, as I told you, of Le Pen and Trump. Uh, to be more specific, I used thematic coding and performance analysis of three types of performances, rallies, debates, and advertisements. The idea for me was to look at various level of control. Like uh, in, the, in a rally, you are surrounded by people that like your ideas. You have full control of how the scenography is gonna be like. The debates are very interesting because it's much more uh, uh, improvised in the sense that you, well, there are some basic control. You are going to be watched by people who don't like you, and you're going to be uh, talking with an interlocutor that does not agree with you. So the, I use a more similar uh, systems design for, for those of you who do social sciences. It's just looking at stuff that are very similar and looking at how they, they are different. In, uh, so Trump and Le Pen were both ideologically roughly the same. So far right, xenophobic, uh, nationalist, um, conservative. Of course, there are differences, but uh, they were both in a heavily personalized context. So both France and uh, the US, unlike say Switzerland, are incredibly personalistic uh, countries in the sense that elections are about the people, about one person. You know, if, uh, you, you don't vote for a certain program, you vote for Mélenchon, you vote for Macron. 
it's not a it's not about uh, ideas here and i think that's what makes it particularly easy for me to look at performance and style and they were both interestingly against the liberal rival i looked at hillary clinton versus macron and what I found interesting, and I think that's, that, uh, that's what kickstarted my project, is that they were both called populists. And it, it, it is true in being called populists. It's true that they did use them. But my research shows that they, are, they use populism in a very different way. And I think that's what I found most interesting is that even within this notion of populist style, you need to look at their own space. You need to look at context. You need, you need to look at their history as performers to understand the differences. So let me just walk you through. For Trump, I talked about the link between extraordinary and ordinary. Trump was very about, all about extraordinary performance of sales. I'm a businessman. I'm going to come out of my jet to show you how wealthy I am. You know, many people talk about Trump as the, um, a post person idea of a rich person, incredibly ostentatious. Well, unlike Le Pen, who was uh, uh, much more subdued. So let's talk. Uh, he talks about self, his self a lot, himself a lot. I think that was, uh, you know. Trump's classic narcissism, which has been quite uh, well developed in the literature, but whereas Le Pen focuses, focused much less on herself and much more on abstract stuff like the nation, France, like and in 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 a certain way she was putting these collective performances ahead of herself. Whereas Trump, you could see that he was not good at talking about America, about the nation. The nation was always secondary to himself, and I think because he was much more comfortable, it was very interesting to look at him always relying on himself a, a lot more. Rhetorically speaking. Uh, I don't know, and something else is that Le Pen had deeper ideological embeddedness. Uh, Le Pen was raised in, before, in a far-right family, whereas Trump was, uh, uh, let's say, an opportunistic uh, person. He changed parties five times in, in 10 years. I think he, uh, um, some people call, to talk about transactional opportunism. He just goes where people are going to tax him less. And I think what was interesting to see is that he tried to, um, to show that he was deep into the far -right, sort of far-right stuff. But uh, Le Pen had much more ease doing it. She navigated the sort of ideas of the far right with a lot more um, precision in, in, in a way. In terms of rhetoric, Trump is very concrete. It, it's like, they're stealing your jobs from Mexico. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 talking, it's not talking about these sort of meta, meta philosophical concepts like the nation and so on. It's all, it, it was all about uh, uh, your jobs are being stolen uh, by China. Uh, so examples were always very concrete and specific, whereas for Le Pen, it was a lot more uh, complicated and a lot, a lot more nuanced. She even used some parts of like a left-wing sort of rhetoric, talking about a uh, precarization of uh, uh, the ravages of capitalism. Uh, he, he used, uh, and I think masculinity and femininity played a big role in the difference. He, uh, uh, Trump was a man and he embodied all the codes of being a man, uh, of being a, a dominant man, not just any man. So. He was a businessman, he was a leader, he was strong, he was tough, he was in your face, he's aggressive. Whereas uh, in political science, uh, uh, we talk about what, the double bind of, uh, of, uh, for, for female performances. When you're a woman, you cannot be too masculine, otherwise it's going to be seen as aggressive, but you cannot be too feminine, otherwise it's going to be weak. So Le Pen had to, to, to use the, what, what we call frontier or pariah femininity. So femininity that you can see in like Margaret Thatcher, uh, Angela Merkel, is like looking slightly feminine, but not too feminine. And I think that explained why she was more subdued about her performances, whereas uh, Trump had full uh, leeway about going wherever he wanted. He, as I told you, he was very good at metaphorical comments, breaking the fourth wall, whereas she, uh, she used a sort of gravitas image. Uh, she used a sort of moral grounding. It's about life and death. It's about threatening the death of our civilization. She used this sort of like deep uh, sort of, uh, so she found herself as a sort of savior of France, but not because France, uh, uh, not because of pure intention, but uh, because France is in such a, a great dire straits. Whereas, whereas, whereas for Trump, it was all about, ah, uh, look at uh, uh, lying Ted and crooked Hillary. Uh, it was very, very, much more concrete. And lastly, while well, he was very good at uh, direct attacks, so I think he insulted pretty much everybody uh, in his, uh, I think there's a great New York Times or New Yorker uh, list of like the 592 people that Trump uh, insulted during 2016. Le Pen was all about insinuation and indirect attacks. So uh, innuendo, uh, what she did, for instance, uh, the key example I use, uh, I develop is during the debate when Macron is kind of uh, lecturing, us, uh, lecturing her about an economic issue. She says, okay, I'm, I'm not here to play teacher and, and student with you, which is of course a blow at him looking like a professor, but also the French audience know that he, he's married to his high school teacher. 
So a, a sort of attack of under the belly uh, insinuation that doesn't need her to be directly aggressive, although she was also, but she was much less than him. And so in conclusion, what I said with, with my thesis that it's important to look at embodied performances individually and collect, connect them with collective constructs, with the nation, the people, the, the elite. My thesis, I try to show and to argue that you need to incorporate theatricality and style if you want to understand the full picture of why, popular, why politics work. And I think, and that's, what I, that's all I was trying to show you in my theoretical section is that it is important to disentangle what is populist distinctively from what is far right. And not just, uh, you know, law and order, xenophobia, nationalism is not populism per se, it's the content you put into it. And so but what, I, what, I, what is interesting is that on the far right, populism is still used because when you say I fight for the white nation, it doesn't quite sound as good as I fight for the people. A fight for the people gives you a sort of popular legitimacy and it builds on a sort of resentment against the elite. So I think that populism here is used as a, a coat of paint to look nicer, to look more popular than, than your alternative. Now let's talk about the ecology for the remaining 10 minutes I have left. Um, what, I, what, what interested me in like, this new project is that when you talk about populism, it's usually even before, right? Like I just did for 10 minutes with you. Trump, Le Pen, or radical left. And just to use their opponents here, uh, Bernie Sanders, Mélenchon. But the issue with that sort of lens is that it, it limits you to the national scale and it's only limit, it limits you to electoral campaigns. So you can't look beyond that. So what I, what I found interesting was that we saw, especially in the last 10 years and even more so in the last five years, the rise of a different sort of green politics, which are movements that are much more complicated than before, right? In the sense that it's both grassroots movements to very like top-down parties and and they, are, they share many, many strategies. And my question that I'm trying to explore in this new project is, is there a link between populism and ecology? And can we see one? And some people say no. Some people clearly say, this is stupid. Uh, this article, which I, which I actually like, uh, by uh, Zulianello and Ciccobelli, they don't call it climate populism. And, and they, they look at Greta Thunberg, who was often called a populist uh, because of, of some of the tropes she was using. And they say, and she, and they say no, no, no. What she's doing is not people centrism, it's ecocentrism, putting the earth at the center. It's not anti elitism, it's technocracy, it's listening to the scientists. And it's not vox populi or vox popular, it's vox scientifica, listen to the scientists. But they did acknowledge some similarities, which are, which are exactly what I'm working on. It's a challenge to the status quo, it's about hom homogenization, talking about the whole youth together, moralizing politics, and antagonistic frame. You have the people destroying the planet, and you have us, the people and individual embodiment, which also brings me to what I, to what I was doing. And because this is Giulianello and Checo Belli follow the ideational approach, which is what I discussed 20 minutes ago, I hope you remember bits of it, that they conflate what is ideologically uh, ecology and what is stylistically populist. And we don't see the sort of complementarity there is. But others do see. I think um, there's, there's been a few works that talk about eco-populism or environmental populism. And in this work, you, you see stuff that is sometimes negative. So eco-populism can be just the way the far right uses green themes, so eco-fascism. But it can also be how populism can be used to help the themes of the ecology. And that's what I really like by uh, uh, Nordensvard and Ketola, talks about populism as an act of storytelling. And they compared, and they saw many similarities between the way Donald Trump and Greta Thunberg, which is kind of an unlikely comparison, act as truth tellers of climate. And they say, while the ideology differs, the articulation of a climate crisis is very similar. And again, if you apply the three categories I gave you, identity, transgression, crisis, it can really work well between politics. Instead of talking about the national people, it can be the global people, the global youth versus the apathetic world elites, be them political leaders or CEO of big companies. Transgression is all about breaking from the capitalist status quo, but I mean, Greta Thunberg, just to quote her, was incredibly transgressive, a young child, not dressed like a politician, speaking in the name of the people. And lastly, the crisis they pick. You know, I remember I, you know, I talked about many crisis narratives and failure in crisis. Well, I mean, here it's kind of obvious, the most, uh, the most urgent crisis ever. But of course, what, uh, and, and, and what I find interesting is that if you use populist style, it kind of answers some of the limits of the three categorization that Zulianello and Ciccobelli were raising. The, idea, the issue of ecocentrism, talking about in the name of a planet, is that it's, it lacks emotional appeal. Like it's hard to identify with a planet or it's like to be connected to it. So bringing the sort of people centrism brings back this sort of personal identification. 
And if you rely on the science, on the scientists, uh, it's nice, but uh, it, it also creates a sort of distance and a sort of um, lack of popular legitimacy. Who are these scientists? Who is choosing them? And so bringing in populism here can also help with that. And last, lastly, the Vox Scientifica is, uh, uh, I think, should remain the root of ecological claims, but it is very distant. It is hard to listen and hard to connect to, which is why using a combination of Vox Scientifica and Vox Populi can be, can be useful here. Because here, populism can bring back human agency back at the center. It can bring back legitimacy to acting in the name of the climate, uh, for the climate, because you act in the name of the people, and it, and it can reconnect the Vox Scientifica with the Vox Populi. And so what I'm saying here is that what they describe, I would say, is a sort of technocratic style, uh, Vox Scientifica, ecocentrism. And I'm not saying that populism should replace it I'm in the green repertoire. I'm just saying that it, should, it can complement it. It could become one of the tools to perform the climate crisis and to make it more compelling. And to do so, it can use some of the positive, intrinsic bits of populism. Populism is about simplifying the issue, making the, the issue with, 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 with green things that it's really hard to, to it's, we talk about systematic problems, making them simpler can be a way to make people relate to them a bit more. You can use emotions, which you don't do in a, in a sort of technocratic field. So talk, mobilizing anger, uh, fear, hope. You can make them, them a bit more relatable. And this antagonistic frame, again, so like, you know, us against the, the people not doing anything can create an impetus to move, to be like, we all agree, but why are, we not, why are we not moving? Because these people block us. And this sort of creates a sort of impetus to move more. And of course, the performing a crisis helps with urgency and necessity to to go and, and, and break the rules in a way. But of course, populism has its issues. Because even when you remove any sort of reactionary content from it, the, emanci the emancipatory potential has limitations. And maybe that's where I think, it, I'm, I'm saying populism is not a panacea, not something that will solve any issue. Because it, if you simplify it too much, you, you, it leads to the issue of losing any sort of uh, uh, accuracy. If you're relying too much on embodiment and top-down identification, you lose the sort of uh, grassroots power of, of the ecology. The sort of conflictual frame, you can, and I think this is a bit too complicated for the five minutes I have left, but you can move from seeing them as rivals, agonism, to enemies, you're hating them as antagonism. So if you, if you emphasize too much the conflictual frame, it can lead to a sort of con uh, endorsement of political violence, which, uh, where, which has its issue as well. It can homogenize complex issues without leaving round, uh, grounds for intersectional concerns on class, gender, race, but also like more local issues. And of course, there's this idea, and that's attention at the heart of ec ecology is how do you, do you combine the local level from, with the global and how do you make people connect to it? So in a way, the people's time here is not a panacea, as I was saying, not a the solution to everything, but I'm saying that it is a tool, one of, and we should not just completely disregard it just because it's been used so well by the foreign. And so here we, we arrive at the very last slide, which are more about my current project and perspective questions I have on it. The idea is that I look at the intersection of populism and green politics. I look at five countries, France, Belgium, Sweden, UK, the US. And here I intend to look at a pair for each country of a politician and an activist. And I look especially at those with polarizing, again, coming back to this antagonistic frame, and those with high mediatic presence. And I think that's when I finally talk about Sandrine Rousseau, which I, uh, in France, but I've, I've been repeatedly talking about Greta Thunberg. But these sort of equivalences of to these people in other countries is not as easy to do. You can see someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the US, but if they're a sort of activist in the US, I look at it like the embodiment of uh, youth as Greta Thunberg is, and likewise for France. So what I try to do is combination, as I did in my thesis of discourse and performance analysis, along with interviews, I, I use what I call narrative interviews, which are basically semi-structured interviews with a, a narrative twist. And here are the challenges that I'm facing. And, I'm, uh, and if you have any suggestions on this, this is exactly what I'm trying to work, all the issues that I'm working on at the moment, I'm trying to work out by the end of the year. So the question is who to analyze because green movements are so horizontal and rhizomatic. It's really hard to choose one person for each or to choose one organization. My, uh, the other issue for me is comparing political campaigning, which is very structured and very limited in time with activism, which happens all the day at all times and it can be in any, any moment. And I'm wondering if I should just focus on either activism or politicians and not just try to do a sort of hybrid combination of both. I wanted to look at one activist like Greta for embodiment, but maybe I'm, I'm wondering if instead of using one activist, I should use a group. And then the other question for me are which performances to look at. I looked at interviews, I, look, I looked at rallies and debates and a political advertisement in my thesis. 
But for this one, I'm wondering if I should look at protest actions, at public declarations, interviews, debates. There's so many ways to, so many performances, and I cannot, there's only so much I can do, especially with five cases. And again, the last question is, there's so many cases in the work I'm trying to do. And my question is, how can, can I make sure that I'm representative? Should I take more cases for each uh, country? Should I limit the number of countries? And I think these are all the sort of considerations I'm at. So yeah. Yeah, just a summary of what I what I, I've discussed, uh, just for you to, to sort of be reminded of uh, what we uh, what I walked you through. First one is that populism illustrates the potential of dividing content and form. I think that's really what I really want to show here. That it's important to distinguish them because even though they are linked and connected, and in practice always uh, symbiotically interrelated, it's it's useful analytically speaking to distinguish them. Then normative challenges, I mentioned anti-populism, populist hype. So when you talk about populism or when you see the word populism, be careful who uses it and try and think of how it can, how it can be used there politically. The third point was about showing that if you bring in performance studies, you, sh you, you, you give a lot more depth and a lot more power. I couldn't develop this as much as I would have wanted and I'm already out of time. But uh, this is a part that I'm really uh, pushing in, in my work to bring in more than one, one discipline because their tools are so useful. Then I, de I defined the populist repertoire as a combination of identity, transgression, and crisis. I talked in my thesis about how the, it's connected with the far right. And finally, I talked about my new project on populism and ecology and potential links and limitations. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thor, for this.